field trip. I didn't lie. I just told Ma and Pop, off to school, and I am. I make sure to keep my hoodie up and my chin down. I hope nobody recognizes me. I skip across the school steps on my way to the subway. There, five skips worth. I was at school. I stuff my hands in my pockets. It's mid-October. Ma says she's going to find me a coat at Goodwill. We haven't gone yet. Pop's worse. He sleeps all the time. Ma says Pop is depressed. When she's not working, she stays in our room, making sure he eats, dragging him by the hand to the cafeteria. He seemed better after he saw Miss Garcia, like they shared something. He stopped complaining about my lessons, but Pop is always like this, better than worse. I heard Ma on her cell phone crying, telling Auntie Rita he might have to go to the hospital. She thought us kids were asleep. While in the dark, she wept, whispering into the tiny metal phone. Too much, she said. Too long. Nothing helped. I shivered in bed. It wasn't supposed to be this cold. I tucked Lita's icy feet against my tummy. During the fall, Pop always gets extra gloomy. I stop, catch my breath. No, every September, Pop gets worse. Why didn't I connect it sooner? September. Pop starts to unravel, becoming sad, distant. I just connected his moods to Thanksgiving and Christmas. Holidays are when I want most for our family to be happy. Like the white families on TV and in magazines, eating turkey, opening presents, or playing board games. We never play board games. I can't remember when Ma last baked the turkey. My last gift was a ribbon. Nauseous, I close my eyes. I feel Brooklyn swirling about me. People chattering, feet stomping, and taxi horns honking. I want to scream, quiet, but the noisy city won't mind me. Am I doing the right thing? Maybe I should stay in Brooklyn, leave it alone, forget 9-11, wondering what it means to Pop, to her family, and me. Forget everything, except I'm in the best school I've ever been. Avalon isn't so bad, Ma has a job, and I'm getting older every day. In high school, I might get a job at McDonald's. I'll buy Lita a baby doll, Ray a race car. I'll give Ma my pay to Ma. Cuckoo! I look skyward. Ma said New York has tons of birds, but mostly folks are so busy, streets so loud, people miss seeing them. Cuckoo! I search the trees, a morning dove. See, Deja? It's slender, small-headed, grayish-brown, with dark eyes. I remember Ma stooping beside me, her arm about my waist, her finger pointing at a maple. See? I see it to my left in the tallest tree. Cuckoo! Morning doves sound like they're crying. I want to cry. But I bet on Brooklyn streets no one would notice or care. I clench my fists. Wings whistling, the dove takes off, ascending. Then it lands whistling on a tree just above me. I whistle, sharp, sweet. The dove's head tilts. He looks at me. Cuckoo! I remember Ma said, Doves fly straight and powerful. Maybe that's why their wings whistle. They aren't really sad. Or if they are, it doesn't stop them from flying, going where they want to go. I can stay at Avalon, stay at school, just stay. But nothing about my family will change. I know it. Ma and Pop are stuck. Maybe seeing where the tower stood, I might help Pop, Ma, all of us, get unstuck. Get out of Avalon and move on to a better life. It's a slim hope, but it's all I have. I inhale. I'm Deja, the original. One and only. I don't want to be stuck. Whistling. The dove takes off, flies, point A to point B. Whistling, I take off, too, running, flying down the street. On the ground, I have to weave around people, trees, lampposts, and trash cans. But I still feel good like I'm flying. Moving is better than going nowhere. I see Ben. I whistle sharp. He's got his backpack. And it makes me feel good that he's prepared. He's a good friend. As I move toward him, I wonder maybe Ben has a reason too. 
not just for me, but for him too. Subway. An extra pair of gloves. Thanks, Ben. I put on the gloves and the subway ding dings. The doors close and the train lurches. Even though it's October, it feels like winter. Last night felt colder than the North Pole. There's no room to sit. We grab hold of a silver pole. It's still huffing, breathing deep. Right above our heads, two tall men in thick coats and knit caps hold the pole, talking about the Knicks. Beneath their arms, I glimpse. Folks sitting to the right and left. Everyone is bundled warm. Are we on the right train? Yeah. C train. Northbound to Jam Chambers World Trade Center. Figuring it out was easy. Seems like it ought to be hard. Yeah, I know. The train is packed. Mainly grown-ups going to work. Tourists. Two women with babies. The kid in the stroller kicking her feet looks like Lita. The other is an infant is in an infant sling. Nobody notices me and Ben. Warm breaths, sweating bodies make fog, clouding the windows. The train rocks and sways. I'm warmer than I felt all day. Avalon is an ice box. I like the buzz of voices, the slippery seats, the bright lights, the posters blaring. Study computers. Become a dental assistant. Another poster, a scary brown and gray with a grin. Policeman asks, have you spoken to your kids about drugs? I start worrying again. I wish this was a happy adventure. Ben's cap is pulled over his ears. Even though it's warm in the train, his cheeks are still red. The encyclopedia said Arizona is famous for sun and blue skies. Was it hard coming to New York? I hated the plane. Ben blinks. I mean, I know what he's thinking. At least my plane didn't slam into a tower never been on a plane, I say. I'd never been on the subway until I came to New York. Look at this. He pulls a folded map from his jacket. The train lurches, slows to a stop. Folks push, trying to leave the train. Other folks shove, trying to get in. Here, Ben pulls me toward an aging couple lifting shopping bags. Two seats. We'll slip into them as they get up and high five. Score. You're a good traveler, Ben. He grins. You have to be quick in New York. He unfolds the spread and spreads his map on our laps. Look, Deja, isn't it beautiful? Complicated lines, parallel, horizontal, intersecting, crisscrossing lines. Blue lines, red, orange, green, and yellow. The sea line is blue. Beneath the earth, subway lines make up and around Central Park. Some lines merge, others stretch to and from Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, and Manhattan. It all flows. You can get anywhere you want in Arizona. Everyone had cars. If you didn't drive, you didn't go anywhere. What about your horse? Blaze. His name is Blaze. We never left the ranch. He, we had trails and special places. We'd pitch camp near red boulders or else by the dry creek bed where I'd dig for fish fossils. Mostly Blaze grazed beneath mesquites while I read. I almost say something dumb like, you must miss it. I can't clamp my lips shut. Ben sniffs and beneath his glasses wipes his eyes. I want to kick myself for making him feel bad. For about a year, we lived in town in an apartment. I kept thinking mom and dad would get back together. I'd get back to the ranch. It's better here, living in New York. I know I'll never go back. At least, not till I'm grown. Not even to visit? Our bodies sway, bumping into each other. Across the aisle, a woman sleeps, her head thrown back, her mouth open. A gray-haired man with an unlit pipe rattles his newspaper. Ben turns, his eyes mournful. Deja, my dad doesn't call much, hardly at all. Mom says some people try to forget the past, forget whatever happened. How can you forget a kid? He might change. Want to remember? You think so? Then Ben shrugs. Not sure he wants to remember Afghanistan or arguing with my mom. Mom says it's nobody's fault. They grew apart. I feel sick, sad. Me and Ben are alike, except he knows what's happening to his dad. My pop didn't go to war, 
but he's been disappearing just the same. Surprising me, Ben smiles. I don't have Blaze, don't have a pasture to ride, but I can travel underground, all over New York, from Brooklyn to the World Trade Center. I don't have to wait for my mom to drive me. He pulls out a red pen from his backpack. Look at all the places I, I mean, we can go. Arizona Ben is going to show me Manhattan, I say, kind of sarcastic, but not too much. The train turns, our shoulders bump into each other like another high five. On the map, Ben circles Central Park. He circles the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's where Claudia ran away to. Who? Claudia, from the mixed-up files of Miss Basil E. Frankenweiler. The museum is supposed to be beautiful. Paintings, drawings, sculptures from all over the world. He circles Lincoln Center. What do they do there? Ballet, music, theater. Expensive. There are discounts. half price tickets for Broadway. I want to see Wicked, a musical about the Witches of Oz. I bend over and look down. What are you doing? Checking to see if you're still a cowboy wearing your boots. Everybody knows New York City is the greatest city in the world. I didn't know that, I answer irritably. Ben's shocked, I can tell. Paris didn't bother with Phoenix. New York is great. Not everything is great, I murmur, feeling crankier and crankier. Mostly, I know Brooklyn. What's wrong with knowing Brooklyn? Everything can be found right here in New York City, in the U.S. of A. I look down the rows of orange subway seats, at the people leaning against or gripping poles. Some are fat, some thin, some old, some young. A homeless man is riding the subway, I can tell. He's wearing all the clothes he owns, none of them clean. There are men in black wool coats with leather gloves and soft scarves about their necks. Women in high heels with jewelry and painted nails who aren't desperate for food. Billboards in Brooklyn show beautiful, fancy dressed people. No one in Avalon is half as pretty as the models. But some of the subway people come close. If you have money, it's easier to look better, prettier. It's true in Brooklyn. It's true in Manhattan. I bet it's true in Arizona, too. Angry, I squirm. Borrowed gloves, no puffy down jacket, no hat or scarf like Ben. Maybe I shouldn't wear everything I own. I'd be warmer. Being warmer might be better than pretending I can dress normal in cold weather. Then it dawns on me. Central Park must have been free. Ben shakes my arm. His face is serious, and I feel like he can see right inside me, like he knows I want to hit something. Ben pulls out his sketchbook. He draws fast. The pretty women, the tired construction worker, the happy new mom, and the homeless man. Asian and Hispanic people, black and white people, gentlemen with warm coats and pot bellies, a young man with headphones, low jeans, and underwear showing, a toddler waving at the homeless man. Look, Deja, Ben's talking to me with straight and curvy lines, shade and light. Ben sees differences, every person special, connected. I exhale, relax. Then I start to laugh. Social units. Miss Garcia would be so proud of us. All of us on the subway are part of a circle. American. As if Ben could mind read, he writes making it look like a graffiti. Americans. You're cool, Ben. I didn't know it, but you've always been cool. I know. The subway lurches, and another wave of people goes out, comes in. But why the World Trade Center? Mom says it represented capitalism, American Commonwealth, opportunities. Ma left Jamaica for a better life. Yeah, immigrants, people coming for the American dream. I stare as Ben draws. You can tell how much he likes people. He sees everyone as equal. That's how he, Sabine too, sees me. Money might be a part of the American dream, but it isn't all of it. Like a building doesn't make a home, Ben nods. We might be poor, but Ma didn't go back to Jamaica. Sabine's family is richer, but they didn't go back to Turkey. They're Americans. Yeah, American. Then I crack up laughing until my side aches. People look at me, but I can't stop. Some folks smile. The man holding the rail above me chuckles. Ben laughs. Why are we laughing? You know how our history book, the cover, 
but an eyebrows wrinkle. You know those white men with funny shoes, stockings, and wigs signing the Declaration of Independence? Ben, come on, 1776? Ben grins. They started it, the American dream. Look at America now, I say, pointing at Ben's drawing. He grins and sketches a cloud above the subway train. Leaning out of the cloud, looking down, is a wrinkled white man with glasses. Ben Franklin? Ben sketches more. Who's that? My grandmother. She's dead. She left Mexico for a better life. Fourteen. She came to America by herself. I can't imagine doing that. Maybe before I go back to Arizona, I'll visit Mexico. I'm sure I have relatives there. Ben's loneliness is peeking out. I can't imagine being an only kid plus having separated parents. Your grandmother was brave, just like my ma. Your mother, too. I never thought of it like that. He closes his sketchbook, stuffing it into his backpack. He pauses, then nods, blinking behind his glasses. It must have been hard leaving Arizona. Yeah, he says, sounding happier. My mom dreams. That's why we're in New York. I lean back against the seat. Does Pop dream anything other than bad dreams? We're already in, Air in America, but maybe we should move to Arizona. Maybe the whole family could ride horses, swift and strong. Ben opens a tin with painted yellow flowers. Sabine wanted to come. She doesn't like breaking rules. Nope. So she made us sweets, she said. Sappy, sappy, sappy. Better than sour, I chuckle. An elderly woman dressed in a black skirt and a wool coat with shawls leans against Ben, her finger pointing. Ah, baklava. My mother used to make. Want one? She claps her wrinkled hands. Good boy. Her fingers pluck a brown, flaky baklava. I pluck one, too. I've never tasted baklava. Inside, it's crunchy with nuts and sweet with syrup. Maybe Sabine's right about following the rules. The taste turns sour. My stomach knots. I clench the tin. Napkins are stuffed on the inside. I wrap my half-eaten baklava. I'm going to throw it away, but I don't want to waste Sabine's gift. Our stop, shouts Ben, zipping his backpack. We squeeze past people near the exit. I hand the tin to the homeless man, opening it. He sighs happy. Ah! The subway doors close. Through the window, I see the homeless man offering a baklava to his neighbor. The flowered tin passes person to person. Folks on the subway train smile, just like earlier. Many of them laugh. Plenty of their happiness makes me feel worse that I'm doing something wrong. Ben and me are going to be in big trouble. Worse, not for seeing something good, but for seeing something bad. Ben, I'm scared. I know, me too. Our stop. We walk through underground tunnels. Grown-ups everywhere swirl around us. Sounds echo, harsh. We follow the signs. Exit, world trade. I double skip, making sure I don't lose sight of Ben's backpack. At the bottom of a hill of stairs, we look up. All we see is a silver sky. Come on, we climb. I feel like folks behind me are pushing me to climb faster and faster. Some pass Ben, their hips swiping his backpack. On the other side of the rail, folks rush down. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I want to slow down. After the first hill of stairs, there's another and another. Near the top, there's freezing air. I push my hoodie up. Zip it tight. Ben unwraps his woolen scarf. Here. I take it, mumbling. Thanks. We walk fast. Signs are everywhere. 9-11 Memorial Museum. September 11th Memorial and Museum. This way. That way. I hear snatches of languages I don't understand. See folks in long, crooked lines. Seems like the whole world is here. I didn't expect a crowd. Police in thick black jackets, some smiling, some not, are scanning faces. They've got guns, walkie-talkies. Some stand or stroll. Some are on horses. Another directs a sniffing German shepherd. I bet I'm not allowed to pet him. A lady hands us brochures. We're in. Past the gate, Ben squeezes my hand. The sky is overcast. The mood's serious. People are polite. And Ben and me shuffle as the line moves, nervously hoping no one asks about parents or teachers. 
The walkway widens and widens. The first thing I see are hundreds of oak trees. They are young, thin, with peeling bark, branches pricking the air. The frost has made some leaves wilt droop. Others are turning orange gold. I don't hear birds, just water. It rushes, pours, like I imagine a waterfall would. I can't explain. The water calls me. Come on, Ben. My heart beats fierce, yet I feel mournful. My legs waited, slowing me down. Whoosh, whoosh. The water keeps calling, whispering. Come see, come see, look, come see. I walk faster and faster, direct and straight. Ben is right beside me, and we both press our bellies against a thick ledge, lining a huge black square hole. Water cascades down, 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 from all sides of the square, swirling, pooling, and descending into another deeper, darker, blacker square. You can't see the bottom, whispers Ben. I look up and across two of them. Two squares lined with water draining into a smaller black hole. Footprints. These are the tower footprints. I mean, what's left? The foundations. Yeah, the movie said they dug over 70 feet down to support the towers. Both their hands tilt up. Air, sky, nothingness. No glass, no metal or concrete. In my mind, I see ghost outlines. Shimmering towers touching the clouds. All around the footprints, people are stunned, looking down. Then up, then down again. The man next to me is crying. His hands cover his mouth, but you can still hear his gurgling moans. I tug Ben's sleeve, whispering, These are graves, too. Holes where the towers collapsed, where people died. Ben's face is bleak. My stomach hurts again. Our heads tilt down. Our bones? Pieces of buildings still buried here? Did ashes mix with dirt? I shiver. Wind shakes the trees. Whips the woolen scarf, I blink against the cold. Nothing beautiful happened here, but the sight is beautiful. Water falls thirty feet before streaming into another square that seems bottomless. He reads the bro brochure. It's a void. What's a void, Ben? Nothingness. He reads, a space unfilled, unoccupied. I inhale, exhale, feeling a strange peace. Mist rises from the waterfalls. My face is slightly damp. Polished rock glistens. It's both horrible and beautiful. Ben slings his backpack to the ground, takes out his book, and starts sketching. You're a real artist, Ben. Reflecting absence, the brochure said. That's what they call this part of the memorial. It does, doesn't it? Reflect what isn't here. Add the water, Ben. Water makes it clean, special. Ben draws water. Around us is a forest of trees, I think. Nothing can live without water. It's a metaphor, I say, like we study in stories, poems. Water is life. Tears, Ben replies, laying charcoal lines, constantly falling. Feels better after you cry. The man beside me has stopped crying. Healing. Can I have that? The man asks. I've never seen Ben shy. His cheeks flame. He mumbles, his hands covering his sketchbook. You're not from here. New York, I say. He's wearing a plaid cap. Big red earmuffs hang over the cap. Kansas. This is my daughter. He points at the ledge we've been leaning on. Names. I was drawn to the holes. The water. My mind didn't connect the markings. Names. Hundreds. Thousands of names. Etched in bronze. So no one forgets. The man's fingers trace K. T and A. She always wanted to work in New York. He wipes his eyes. See the name? It's her friend. They worked in the same office. Got a picture of your daughter? He reaches inside his coat. Handshaking, he opens his wallet. She looks just like her dad. Brown hair, small blue eyes, pretty white teeth. Her college graduation. He doubles over, one hand covering his daughter's name. Even though he's a grown-up, I want to pat his back like I do Ray's and Lita's. Ben folds the picture, touching the man's free hand. The man grabs it, pressing it against his chest. Ben and me move away, giving the man privacy. We cross to the South Tower's footprint. Same, horrible, beautiful. More and more names. 
Looking around the footprint, I see white roses sticking out from the grooved letters. One rose is across from me, the other side of the void. Another is just to Ben's right. How come there are roses? It would have been their birthday today. I'm startled by the rough voice. Surprise, the dead have birthdays. A policeman stands behind, but between me and Ben. Nine white roses today. Some days, only two or three. Some days, more. The policeman reminds me of Pop. Thick, dark brows, broad nose, except his eyes are still curious. Not like a part of him is disappearing. Going, going, his spirit, sometimes gone. Ben tugs me. Come on, Deja, we've got to go. Come on. He pulls me back to the first tower. The man who lost his daughter is gone. Ben whispers, the cop. Is he still watching us? I look back. Yeah? So? So, we're supposed to be in school. Fear roars. I forgot. Trouble, trouble. We're going to be in so much trouble. Ben and me walk quickly, almost running, as far away from the officer as possible. I shiver. It's gotten colder. The sky is cloudier. On cue, snowflakes fall. I think of the people falling, leaping from the towers. Snow melts on a memorial. It never snows in October. I feel like the weather is telling me I should have stayed away. I look around me at folks whispering, pausing beneath trees. Some folks silent or crying, looking into square tower graves. Where's your teacher? The cop is beside us. Ben elbows me. Your parents? Ben starts creeping, walking backward. We're going inside the museum. I nod, my feet creeping too. I've been watching you, says the officer, moving forward as we move back. You shouldn't be here alone. You should be with an adult. His face is kind, but his uniform is scary. Everything black except for handcuffs dangling from his belt. Kids should visit the museum with a parent. A teacher? I gulp at the handcuffs. I don't want to be arrested. Run, Ben, I urge, turning, taking off like a firecracker, not looking back. Right behind me, Ben breathes heavy. We run away from the footprints, the silver-gray museum, and past the spindly trees. My body heats up. Cold fades. We run and run, racing to get back to the subway, to get home. Racing, I know, without question, Ben is my friend. Racing, I realize, I still don't understand Pop. Subway, home. The subway train is nearly empty, middle of the day. I think nobody wants to go to Brooklyn. I do, and I don't. 16 voice messages, 22 texts. My mom's mad. Ben shuts off his cell phone again. Q thinks to being told. Probably, but she would have tried not to. Miss Garcia might have told the principal. It wasn't smart skipping school together. If it had been just me, she would have figured I was sick. Ben's shoulders sag. Still, I'm glad, Ben. Glad you were here with me. I know. Both of us slump in our seats. We can hear the engine pulling, the wheels rattling on the tracks. I pull the brochure out of my hoodie. Ben reads with me. Terrorists crashed two planes into the Twin Towers. 2,753 people from 90 nations were killed. Mainly Americans, I think, but just people, human. Oldest victim, 85 years old. The youngest, two. Five, 403 were first responders. Who are first responders, Ben? Firefighters, New York and Port Authority police. Closing my eyes, I lean my head back. Ben does the same. Three more stops, he says. Been trouble. Not as bad as it could be, I think, of the man who lost his daughter, how he remembered her whole life in his heart. I think of Pop. Memories, that's the difference. The footprints were horrible, beautiful. What if Pop only remembers horrible? Pop. The subway train stops. Doors whisk open. Underground, it's another world. Shadowy, warmer than topside. Part of me wants to stay here. Ben and me shuffle forward and climb the steps. The sky gets bigger and bigger, the air colder. I see Dora and Pop standing side by side. Other than Ma, 
I've never seen Pop stand so close to someone. Dora runs forward. How could you, Ben? How could you? On her knees, she hugs him tight. Are you all right? Not hurt? Mom, the subway's safe. Ben's relieved. Dora's more worried than angry. Pop looks mad, all rigid and stark. At least he didn't call Ma. It would have been worse if she'd missed work. I walked up to Pop. I want to explain how I'm sorry, how I needed to go to the memorial, and how I'd do it again if it meant I'd understand him better. I say nothing. Don't smile. I just look at Pop eye to eye. He lifts me off the ground, and I'm being held, crushed by the biggest hug I feel, warm. Pop's cheek is soft on mine. He whispers, Deja, Deja. I feel good. Feet off the ground, I feel like I can fly. Pop sets me down. He nods at Dora. Ben waves, and they both turn toward the street. Thank you, Pop shouts. Thank you. I've never heard Pop say thank you, or much of anything, to somebody other than family. Pop changed, and as if to prove it, he smiles. We'll talk when we get home. The talk. The shelter room is a mess. Beds unmade, our clothes in boxes. Ray's and Lita's few toys abandoned on the floor. It's a wonder how five of us live here. Sitting on the double bed, pop suitcase between us. I can't breathe right. It feels like the room is getting smaller. There's no window to remind me there's air outside. Pop's palms cut my hand. Your ma said I should have told you years ago, but I wanted to protect you. Didn't think you were old enough. Pop's being kind, but underneath his skin, I sense his stress, a low panic in his muscles and bones. Brave. The word pops inside my head, pops being brave. Now that I realize pops talking means more pain, I lie. I'm not old enough. Steam clicks on, the radiator pipes clang, and there's a hiss. Is that true? Seems like a girl can go to the... Pop swells. He doesn't say the 9-11 memorial. Is old enough. What happened to you, Pop? You know what happened? Yeah, but what happened to you? Pop unsnaps the suitcase locks. A red and blue tie. Five plastic bags. A photograph. His hands shake. He lifts the picture. Let's start with family first. Three guys dressed in matching pants, shirts, and red and blue ties, all of them happy, their arms wrapped about each other. Lewis and Big Kelly, my co-workers, friends, Hernandez and O'Brien, and me 15 years ago, so young and stupid, James Barnes. You're not stupid. Pop smiles slightly. Maybe not, but ever since that day, I feel stupid, helpless angry. These were my friends, and I couldn't save them. Pop closes his eyes. His head sags. Your head hurt? I massage his head like Ray does. After a few minutes, Pop kisses my hands. Let me try and finish. I've been delaying telling this story for a long time. Quiet, I sit beside him. Pop stares at nothing like he's staring into a void, deeper and darker than the memorial holes. His voice scratches with emotion. We were teasing Lewis. His wife just had a little girl, and Lewis couldn't stop talking about Miha. Kelly kept teasing, kids are trouble, but Big Kelly and me were setting aside money each payday to buy a baby swing. You wind it up, and it plays music and rocks the baby. Ray and Lita never had such a swing. Did I? I don't remember it. I think we've always been poor. We've just gotten poorer. Like, Pop's headaches have gotten worse. We were the front desk security team. We greeted visitors, signed for packages, important mail, and most of all, welcomed the workers, thousands of them, each day. They'd swipe their badges and we'd say hello, good morning, then later after lunch, good afternoon, then good evening. Ordinary stuff, but we all got to know those faces, those people who worked with us in the North Tower. The sanitation workers, the computer analysis, finance folks, the restaurant team on the 106th and 107th floors. The building was like a small city, and me, Lewis, and Kelly were the day shift, the most important shift, welcoming everybody to work. Like a home. Yes, how'd you know? You said family. In school, we talk about social groups, how we form connections, relationships. Pop hugs me. He's got a fine school. I know friends too. 
I wouldn't want any of them hurt. Terrible for anyone to be hurt. Worse, to remember faces. Each one special, different, unique. Funny how personalities fit faces. Or maybe it's faces that fit personalities. Like Sabine, she's so kind, and you can tell because her lips tilt up, ready to smile. And Ben, he wears those funny round glasses and hardly smiles, but there's a calm about his face. Calm but strong. I struggle with my words. Not like a bully strong, a safe strong. Even though he isn't big at all. I know what you mean. Big Kelly was ever so gentle. Lewis, just average size, but he carried himself like a bear. That's how he was that day. Strong, protective. I slip my hand into Pop's. Pop strokes my hair and kisses me right on the nose, like he sometimes does with Lita. Funny this moment. I feel safe. I worked the North Tower for five years. Knew everybody, and everybody knew me. Forty hours a week for fifty-two weeks a year. For five years adds up to 10,400 hours. You get to know folks. Pop chuckles. Me, Lewis, and Kelly made a big to-do about new hires, telling them how the elevators wheezed like lightning, how the building swayed in fierce winds, how the best hot dog could be bought a block away, how working in the towers meant you made it, made it to the center of New York, the center of the world. Pop swallows and trembles. His face looks like he's walking from it, waking from a nightmare. I should have told you years ago, Deja. I've been too terrified. I still see, feel, hear, smell every last bit of it. When I close my eyes, when I sleep and dream, when I see a clear blue sky, that day, the day of the attack, was the clearest day I'd ever seen in New York. Perfect. Blue. A day so beautiful, I promised nothing bad would happen. He pulls out the bags one by one. This is my name tag. This is my walkie-talkie. On this, I heard Lewis and Kelly's cr calls for help. See, the building shook. Bam! Bang! Didn't know then a plane had hit. Only heard emergency distress calls. Lewis and Kelly took the elevator. I told them no, too dangerous. But the building was over a hundred floors. They wanted to race to help, be where they were most needed. I don't know if they ever made it off the elevator, ever got to the firestorm, if the elevator doors opened on desperation, or if they were trapped. Elevator shut down. Elbows on his knees, Pop cries. I wrap my arm about his waist, lay my head on his back. See, Deja? I don't exactly know what happened, but I imagine. Imagining makes my headache explode. Pow. This is my flashlight. He takes the dirty crack light out of a plastic bag. I grabbed it, headed for the stairwell. It was filled with smoke and dust falling like water down the stairs and over the rails. Fire. You could smell it. Even if it was a dozen stories up, the air stank. Folks were rushing down. I recognized them. Even faces twisted with fear, I recognized every one of them. I was scared, Deja. The building kept moaning, chattering its pain. Then electrical power went out. Battery-powered lights switched on. Folks were scared but still trying to be nice, helping others. One, two, four, five, eight, ten. Flights of stairs. I was exhausted. Lungs aching. Still folks coming down, sounding like an elephant herd. Two men were carrying a man in a wheelchair. Coughing, I held my jacket over my mouth. Where was I going? What did I expect to do? I don't know. I just kept thinking I should be running up to help not out, finding co-workers, my work family. I kept going up and up. The handrail was warming closer to the top. The metal rail burned hands. Then the firemen, oh my word, so wonderful, Deja, racing, carrying 65 pounds of equipment, moving like warriors. A few helmet lights crisscrossed in the stairwell. A captain kept soothing, stay calm, everybody. Everybody down. Everybody down. We'll put out the fire. I recognized police. Port Authority police, too. I wanted to help them, be as brave as them. Everybody was escaping, and they were going up. Twelve floors. Folks were more slowly coming down. Smudges, dirt in the air. Small burns. You could tell they were dis disoriented, traumatized. Firemen and police kept stepping faster and faster like they didn't need to breathe. Like they were Superman, Iron Man, Captain America. 
Miss Abel from account the accounting firm on the thirty seventh floor fell against me. I staggered. I knew it was her. She always wore hats, no matter what. Church hats, I called them. Like any second she was going to sing gospel. James, I can't move. Too scared. Help me down, James. Help an old lady down. Miss Abel's eyes were wild. She clutched my shirt. It's bad up there. Bad. Then Miss Abel's hat got knocked off, spinning down the stairwell. She wailed, My hat! My hat! And I knew then her hat covered thinning hair. How it would be been a crown to make her not feel so old. The building whined. Inside, it felt like there was an earthquake, shaking the foundation, the walls, windows, and ceiling. Take me down, please, James. My flashlight shone on floating ash. It was petrifying, ter trying to move frail Miss Abel, feeling the press of bodies pushing down and the responders pushing up. My arms protected her some, inch down, inch down. Pop looks upward at the ceiling. Did you know, Deja? Stretching, steel shrieks, clangs as joints shift. Something told me the tower was dying. Come on, Miss Abel, we've got to move faster, come on. She was trembling and crying. I picked her up, held her like a baby girl. Down, down, down. We squeezed down. In a crunch of people, two steps, one step, trying to get to the first floor. There was a massive shudder. My arms and back got bruised. There was no sound. People, yes, screaming, complaining. But the building seemed to still hush for half a second. It hit me. We're going to die. I don't understand. Neither do I. But there was a silence before the worst hit, before the storm, whatever it was. Floor three. We made it to three when there was a rush and roar like a train barreling down a track. You could hear screams high above, clashes, clangs, explosions, concrete bursting, windows breaking. I started running and ran and ran, keeping Miss Abel close to my heart. She was crying like a baby, and I kept saying, hush, it's all right. When I wanted to scream, my mind and heart out. The tower was collapsing. We barely made it out alive. Smoke, rock, and ash were everywhere. Pop, I'm so sorry. He picks up another plastic bag, my wallet, so dirty, even though it was in my pocket. Pop hugs me, whispering in my ear. People's belongings flew everywhere. He pulls back, taking the last bag from the suitcase. I got Miss Abel to an ambulance, both towers down just gone. Crippling smoke, pulverized concrete. This bag, he holds it high, holds some of the dust, ashes too. Why do you keep it? Reminds me what's inside me, what's inflaming my lungs. That's why you cough? I didn't know Pop had a real reason to be sick. It reminds me too of how worthless I was, am, how I couldn't protect my work family, not then, how I can't protect my family now. Look at this place. I do. It's sad looking. On the floor, Ray has some blocks stacked high. Amazing they haven't been knocked down. I can't believe Lita left her pink pacifier on the bed. Ma nailed a blanket to the wall to cover cracks. Eyes closed, elbows on his knees. Pop wheezes. I think you're a hero, Pop. If Miss Abel were here, what do you think she'd say? Pop opens one eye and looks at me. And then he opens the other. How much family do you think Ms. Abel has? How many folks did you make happy? Children, grandchildren, sisters, uncles. Without you, there wouldn't be our family. Ma would have married someone different, and it wouldn't be the same. Better. How can you say that? I'm Deja, the original, one and only. You're my brave pop. Then I gave him kisses. Like he used to give me kisses, hundreds of them all over his face, his brow, eyelids, and nose. Kisses so fast and furious. All you can do, all Pop can do is laugh and laugh some more. Pop, I hesitate. I don't want to make him feel worse, but I have to know. Pop was there. Why do they hate us? The terrorists? I don't know. I've been wrestling with why. The World Trade Center was America's financial engine, the American dream, Pop rasps. Because of the terrorists, I've lost it. Can't hold a job, even when my cough is better, closed spaces, blue skies, make me anxious. That can't be all of it. I mean, innocent people died. Families, relationships were broken. 
destroyed. Pop strokes my hair. I think the terrorists don't understand that. If they did, they couldn't hurt innocent people. I want to fall on the bed and cry and cry. I never should have been angry at Pop. Six weeks at a new school has changed everything. School didn't teach me everything about 9-11. Still, I understand a lot more now. I understand some of the enormous hurt to families, my family, and country. Pop, I don't think it's just jobs and money. I think maybe the terrorists hate us because we believe in freedom. For everybody. Freedom to be who you are and have different religions. Isn't that why folks immigrate? That's what makes our society family. America. Home. Even though we're all different, we're the same. Americans. Pop's eyes brighten. You must be the smartest girl in your class. No, Pop. There's a lot of smart kids. But I'm learning. The skyline... Manhattan skyline has changed. You should see the September 11th memorial pop. Take me inside the 9-11 memorial museum. We should see it together. The End What Doesn't Ever Change by Deja Barnes Skylines can change where you live can change. Even people change. Pop's new doctors gave him the right medicine and at night we walk to the river, sit on the bench, and talk. Pa says it helps him feel better. Me too. Next year, I'll be in the sixth grade. Vita stopped using her pacifier and pull-ups. Ray loves school. One day he'll be taller than me. Everyone is changing. Ma's happier. We're moving to a subsidized apartment. It'll be better than Avalon. Not great, but better. Some things never change. Family, friends, relationships, connections between people are always important. America is one big family, one big home. When the towers fell, I think everybody did their best to help and be strong. Like Pop, some died, some got wounds you could see, some got wounds you couldn't. Like Ben's Pop, like mine. Ben's Pop came to New York for our field trip. One day, Ben's going to take me to Arizona to feed his horse. I know this is not being focused, but I'm adding it anyways. It's important. It means something like my family eating at Sabine's house. I just don't know how to say it right. Though it's horrible, I'm glad I know about 9-11. It's history, just like the past. Past history, going all the way back to America's birthday. July 4th, 1776. America has changed and not changed American values. Our part of my present, of Pops, of Sabine's, of everyone's. Miss Garcia had nightmares for months after 9-11. She says people helping people made her feel safe again, strong. American values are a part of my future, too. I love my American home. We are a family, not perfect. Not all the same, some rich, some poor, all kinds of religions and skin colors, some born in America, and some immigrating here. It's the 15th anniversary of 9-11. Americans believe in freedom. 240 years as a nation. And this belief hasn't changed.